political event. We're so glad that you're here to join us. I'm Jesse Paul, political reporter here at The Sun. And events like these are really made possible by our members. And I'll just start out by saying that joining The Sun is quick and easy at calledersun.com slash join. For just $5 a month, you can help make local journalism possible in the state and bring us, uh, help send us into all corners of Colorado to, to bring you the news that, that you need to kind of understand your state and um, make good decisions wherever, wherever you're doing at the ballot box. If you become a premium member, you also get the, unaffili the unaffiliated newsletter, which lands in email inboxes on Tuesday and Friday mornings, really peels back the curtain on Calder politics and policy. And it's become a must read for the state's most politically connected, including many of the panelists here tonight. Um, it, it, heading into an election year, it's going to be kind of a critical thing to kind of unwind all the ins and outs of what's going on in, in the 2024 uh, contests and the presidential and the primary and then the uh, general election in November. I want to also thank tonight's sponsors uh, for the sponsors of tonight's event, Colorado Education Association and Ponte and Busan Public Affairs. We also want to share that the Colorado Sun is now a member of the Trust Project. You can see our commitment to trusted journalism at coloradosun.com slash ethics. And as a reminder, as always, you can submit questions during the event that we can will be fed to us and we can try and get to as many as them, of them as possible at questions at coloradosun.com. Uh, we might not get to all of them, but we will try our best. And I want to just, I guess, now jump right into uh, tonight's main event. So first, we want to welcome Governor Jared Polis, who's in his second term leading the state. He doesn't need much of an introduction. Uh, thank you so much for governor uh, for joining us, Governor. I appreciate it. I understand you have some opening remarks, so I'll uh, give you the floor for a few minutes. Well, first, uh, congratulations to the uh, Colorado Sun on becoming a nonprofit. That was just, uh, I think, a few weeks ago. So congratulations on your new status. I assume that means, Jesse, that donations are now tax deductible to the Colorado Sun. Is that correct? That is true. OK, and um, good luck in that in that new status. There's been different forms of these pre-session events for several years with, in person, people posting their one big idea, virtual. Uh, it's always exciting to participate in these sessions. Um, our focus, uh, you know, from the administration standpoint, and I, I don't think there'll be anything uh, totally shocking in our upcoming State of the State next week, but our focus is really around uh, reducing costs for people and housing being the big cost, but certainly saving people money on health care and uh, continuing the work to make Colorado one of the 10 safest states. So a strong public safety agenda. Much of that's already public because it's in the budget documents that we uh, put forward in November and then most recently updated with our January letter. Uh, Coloradans want to be safe in the communities that they live in. People want to be able to afford to live in the Colorado we love. And uh, really a lot of the work that we need to do informed by the people of this state. One of the things I've done over the last few months is we've had listening sessions across the state, formal ones, meaning, you know, 100 people in Grand Junction and Fort Collins, community leaders, city council, people from both parties, commissioners, civic activists, but also informally uh, in the many public events that we've been doing over the last few months and, and every corner of our state. People love Colorado, but people are very concerned about costs and in particular the high cost of housing. So we're really looking forward to working with uh, Democrats and Republicans in the legislature to uh, make a difference and help uh, save people money on housing and continue to reduce costs where we can to help make sure that people can continue to enjoy the Colorado we love. Back to you. Well, thank you, Governor. I realize, I guess this is your sixth legislative session. It's my seventh, so we we have, I got one year ahead of you, but it starts on Wednesday, and we're going to have a lot to talk does about. That, does that count the special sessions, Jesse? There were two of those. So Yeah, well, I guess I, in that case, I'm at 10. So, yeah. um, so you kind of touched on this, right? I mean, the cost of living, housing in Colorado is, is a big topic that every poll that, that I see, it's, it's the top issue for voters. So you've talked a big game on housing, obviously, last year, you know, the, the measure that you put forth didn't make it across across the finish line. And you've kind of telegraphed that, yeah, some of these things are going to come back. But I guess we haven't gotten too many details on exactly what you plan to bring in the 24 session or, or what you plan to support. So I'm curious if you can kind of provide us with some details as, as we kind of barrel toward this thing. I, I think you're going to see a number of uh, bills that will reduce the cost of housing. Our, our uh, calculus is simple. If something reduces the cost of housing, we're for it. If it increases costs for rent or purchase, we are very, very skeptical uh, and and will generally uh, be be opposing those efforts. So so there's a lot of things to do in that realm. Uh, many of them have been talked about for years. But I mean, you know, reducing red tape, making it easier to build uh, transit plan communities. I, I think uh, 
in addition to the cost of living from housing, people are looking, you know, the average Colorado spends about $1,800 on gas for commuting, for instance. So can people live closer to jobs? Can there be better public transit? Uh, can there be opportunities to live in transit line communities? So really looking in holistic a way as possible on how, as we grow as a state, uh, we don't continue to become less affordable, but in fact can become more affordable. And and looking at all those cost drivers, starting with rent and mortgage, but of course that means uh, you know cars, gas, uh, distances traveled. We want people to be able to live closer to work. I mean, being able to have go to soccer games with your kid and after school events is priceless at the end of the day. And too many people are stuck in rush hour commute and, and not able to do those things they love simply because they can't afford to live close to their jobs. So last year's bill got hung up in large part because of this idea that it would have imposed some zoning regulations on local governments or any of the bills that that are going to come out of uh, you know the Democratic caucuses or your office this year. Is, are they going to do anything like that with zoning regulations? Well, again, I think what you see um, Democrats and Republicans doing in many states and similar efforts were, of course, led by Republicans in Republican majority states with Montana, where they were able to. Uh, pass reforms that really lean into private property rights. So, uh, it, you know, if it's your property and your home, you you have certain rights associated with that. And we want to make sure those aren't trampled upon by government and that you're able to use those rights, whether it's, uh, you know, building, you know, if in an area that allows up to three stories, going from two to three stories, running out of room, accessory dwelling units, whatever it is. Uh, I think that defending property rights is a basic Colorado value. And too often those property rights are infringed upon by government. So I guess I'll take that as a yes, but, but do you have any sense of what some of those, um, you know, impositions are? I mean, local governments are obviously going to see that this is. Yeah, I mean, again, it, it's simple. Any Anything that makes it lower cost, quicker, or easier to build housing, we're for. So, I mean, you, you know, there's many things that can do that. Anything that makes it slower or more expensive to build housing, we are very skeptical about, uh, opposed. Uh, and, and I don't think you're going to see one bill, Jesse, if that's what you're asking. I think you're going to see, you know, 15 or 20 ideas from Republicans and Democrats and maybe 10 are good and five are bad. But whatever it is, uh, we'll certainly help analyze those and support the ones that reduce the cost of housing, reduce red tape, reduce bureaucracy, lean into personal property rights, a basic you know, value of mine as a proud capitalist that believes in private property. Uh, so that's kind of what we will be be focused on this session. And you'll hear more about it, of course, in the state of the state. Um, again, I, I'm clear that housing is the biggest expense people on, uh, experience in Colorado. So you can fully expect that the biggest part of our work to save people money will be about housing. And that just flows out of the fact that rent or mortgage is simply the basic, biggest expense that most Coloradans have. So I know there's been talk about accessory dwelling units, and that's something you're really excited about. Senate President Steve Benberg had said that there was going to be potentially some form of incentive toward helping people do that. Do you Can you provide any details about what that policy might look like? You know, again, we love and embrace all those things. I think another key thing is that there is no one silver bullet. It's not like if you do accessory dwelling units, solves Colorado's housing crisis and, and housing is suddenly affordable. But that's a powerful tool. We love them. They're often called mother-in-law suites, casitas. But it enables somebody to have another. It's great for both. I mean, you know, the owner, the homeowner, if their lot is big enough, they can have an accessory dwelling unit. They can rent it out. They can get additional income. Uh, and of course, those are the most inherently affordable kinds of units. What's happened in our state, Jesse, is the most inherently affordable kinds of housing, which tends to be things like accessory dwelling units, but also apartments um, and um uh, you know, uh, duplexes, triplexes, townhomes, those kinds of homes have been the least likely to have been built over the last decade. And so while we need housing inventory across the board, and I'm not saying that we don't need more homes, um, uh, you know, up for the, on the upper end, that's largely taking care of itself. They have been built. But what has been prevented from being built are many starter homes, homes people can buy two, three hundred thousand dollars $300,000, start building equity, and if they are put out for rent, obviously a two or three hundred thousand dollar home is going to have a much more affordable rent than a seven or eight hundred thousand dollar home. OK, so moving on kind of past um, zoning requirements or zoning changes that you guys might make statewide. Um, you and I have talked about construction defects legislation. Obviously, the, the building industry sees this as kind of being the silver bullet toward um, uh, you know, more affordable housing. I know you've said it's not the silver bullet, but Democratic leadership, when we talked to them earlier this week, kind of said that it wasn't part of the main housing package. We know that a bill is coming. Are you involved in that? And is that something, you know, you remain on board with? 
You know, I'm supportive of, again, anything that reduces housing costs. And, and absolutely, there's room to do construction uh, defects reform. Again, it is not a silver bullet. None of these are, right? It's not like you do ADUs and it solves everything. You do construction defects, it solves everything. You do transit plan communities. That's why I'm really hopeful there'll be a comprehensive look. We have a tax credit package that's already public that's in our budget document. It's about 100 and. 20 million uh, that helps too. prop 123 helps all these things but um you, you know you don't just you don't just tweak one thing and it solves something i mean uh and so absolutely we're very supportive of construction defects reform uh we don't want people to somehow think that that would solve it but that can help uh impact which units are for rent and which are for purchase and obviously we all as a basic value uh, I think Democrats as a whole believe that people should be able to build equity purchases better. We totally get that some people might not have a down payment, might be saving up, might have to rent for a while. A roof over your head is very important. But but the goal is obviously equity building and ownership. And to the extent construction defects stands in the way of that, there's absolutely room. But obviously, we also make sure that the um, ability to build apartments or condos exists in our state, and especially along transit corridors and ways that people can save money with less parking requirements or easy bus or rail access. So obviously everyone in Colorado can't afford to buy a home. So there are some bills that I know that the Democratic majority plans to bring on rent, one that failed last year. And I'm, I'm hoping you can weigh in on both of these. I don't know if I've ever heard you talk about these specifically, but one would lift the local prohibition on rent control policies. Uh, that one was brought last year, it failed. And then also there's this so, so-called just evictions bill um, that would set new rules for when someone can be evicted from their home and bar kind of re retaliatory rent increases. Where do you come down on those two policies? Yeah, as I said, I'm very skeptical of anything that would raise rents. And I would I would put those two in that category uh, whenever you try to add complexity. And again, we haven't been category against it. We did, I think, mediation for some people before they get evicted. But whenever you you change that, you have an upward pressure on rent. Same with rent control. Cities with rent control have the highest rents in the country. Um, you know, and, and so we want to go the other way. We want lower rent. And of course, um, I think that the way we do that is we have, of course, more housing. The reason rent is so high is because demand is so high. Colorado is a great place to live, but we've artificially constrained supply and we need to remove some of those constraints on supply. Uh, and allow especially the most affordable kind of units. Again, we've talked about some of them, accessory dwelling units, apartments, uh, multiplexes, shared rooms in, in people's homes. Um, all of these uh, inherently more affordable kinds of housing would help reduce rents. I'm not an economist, so I'm wondering if you can kind of unpack the, your position on rent control a little bit, right? Because I think the rent control policies are often enacted in, in cities and and counties right where the rent is already at a hot high to prevent them from getting higher. So how do you see a rent control policy contributing to, to high rent? I just look at the evidence. I mean, again, you know, and we're obviously open to some, but the cities that have it have the highest rent. It makes Colorado look, you know, dirt cheap. So uh, and, and generally the, you know, reasons for that, if you were asking economists would be it's less of an incentive to build new units if they're going to be rent controlled. So it kind of works the opposite way of what we need, which is more units, because if, um, you know, builders and and the capital knows that the rent won't be able to go up over time, then uh, they're not going to be built. The just returns are there. And we have an undersupply already. So it, it only accentuates the undersupply and then pushes up rent prices for the few units that are out there. So obviously kind of in the housing realm, um, kind of, but also economic realm too is, is property taxes. HH failed, obviously a special session passed uh, during the special session. There was a one-year bill passed, kind of one-year relief. Um, I know that there is a, a, a task force now working on a long-term property tax solution, but one thing that, that some folks have talked about is a progressive property tax solution where uh, people with higher value properties would be charged more and lower uh, value properties would, would maybe get a bigger break or not be charged quite as much. I wonder if that's something that you'd be supportive of uh, if that came out of the, the task force. Well, I, I think what we did in a special session is we absolutely gave a bigger break to lower value property. We, we basically reduced every the taxable portion of every property by $55,000. So if you had a $400,000 home, you're going to be paying taxes on $345,000 of that $400,000 home. If you have a $2 million home, you're paying taxes on one point, you know, nine, uh, uh, 1.945. So, I mean, the tax break it was built that way. There was a slight rate reduction as well. I absolutely think rate reductions have got to be part of it. But we're very open to uh, 
whether they continue that 55,000 or, 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 you know, make it 60 or 70,000, whatever it is, I, I think knocking the dollar value off the home helps as long as it's accompanied by a rate reduction. I think you'll see most of us kind of waiting to see what this, uh, what the bipartisan commission does, Jesse. And, uh, you know, I, I know they're just starting their work and I think they will be coming out in March and uh, I'll be happy to, you know, analyze it and, and take a look at what they have to say. Yeah, I mean, I guess I know that the legislature has limited tools in terms of property taxes, right? And if they want to make it progressive, one of the ways to do it is to do those um, value reductions or value exemptions. I don't know if you can legally set rates for different value homes, but I guess, I mean, do you envision a long-term property tax solution really being passed by the legislature? It seems like it would have, be, have to be something that would go to voters in 2024 or 2020. Yeah, I mean, I don't think we constrained. I don't think we constrain that bipartisan bipartisan commission one way or the other. I mean, I think that they can look at what the legislature can do, but um if there's something the legislature wants to put in the ballot, we're happy to look at that too. Um I'm for a lower rate to be clear. I mean, if they want to do a little bit of dollars off, we're fine with that, but we fought for the lower rate. We really want a lower rate. Uh, obviously, homes that are two million dollars pay a lot more property taxes than homes that are five hundred thousand dollars. So, um, I, I think the 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 problem is uh, the values went up um, a lot more than ever before. It's not necessarily a problem we're likely to have again in, with the next assessment period. It's kind of a a, a bit of a, a, a an unfortunate timing with the repeal of Gallagher and then the biggest two year increase. I think in Colorado history, it's an average of forty percent. I think we got that forty percent increase down to about an eighteen percent increase over the two year period, which still outpaced inflation, which maybe was around twelve percent, but it's a lot closer. So I'm for any way that we can reduce property taxes. I think uh, a rate cut has got to be part of it, but uh, we're not saying that needs to be the whole thing. All right, last housing centric question for you, and, and it's a, a topic that I know is dear to both of our hearts. So oh, one more thing. There was another thing in HH that I can point out. I, and right. I don't know what and I can't I don't know what the commission's doing, but obviously I supported HH as a whole. And uh, one of the things that was in it was um, it gave additional breaks to owner occupied. And so um, just as there's a home mortgage interest reduction federally owner occupied, you don't you don't get that on additional uh, that I I don't know if the commission is considering that, but that was something that you know w was in HH where if you live there, it's a lower rate. Yeah, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that with Senator Hansen when he jumps on in the next segment. Um, and, and last housing related question here: uh, over the summer, the Colorado Sun did an investigation looking at HOA for foreclosures, and afterward, you and a group of Democratic lawmakers vowed to take more action to prevent people from losing their homes at auction because they you know have missed payments or fines. Um, what updates can you provide on the work in this area? You guys promised big change, but I, I just haven't heard too much about what, what might be coming this session. Yeah, I mean, again, you know, you're asking about uh, bills we haven't seen yet, Jesse. So obviously, um, you know, I, I think there likely will be bills in that area. It's a general direction we support. I mean, these, you know, it's and we already to be clear, we've already done some reforms in this area. But it's, you know, absurd um, if, you know, for not cutting your lawn, you know, your home is seized or something like that. I mean, there's these horror stories that exist. Uh, and, you know, if you're outside of an HOA, a city isn't going to seize your home over not cutting your your, your lawn. Again, you'll, you might be subject to some kind of civil penalty and uh, and it might hurt your credit record, but they're not going to they're not going to seize your home. So uh, HOAs should be looked at similarly to kind of municipal creditors for homes that are outside of HOAs. And right now, some of them are a lot more aggressive. Um, a recent press conference, I kind of uh, asked you about this, but there is some talk about a new some new transportation funding this year, and that might potentially include include a new funding source, whether that's a fee or uh, some kind of tax increase. Um, and this would be specifically to boost transit, which I know is is important to you as part of the kind of overall housing conversation. So would you be open to, you know, a new funding mechanism, whether it be a fee or some kind of tax increase to kind of make that transit reality that, that you're really hoping for um, come true? And, and I would say this would be probably separate from the front range rail, which I know is a whole nother near and dear. Yeah, I mean, I mean, separate, but interrelated. I mean, front range rail, we view as a, it's a kind of transit, right? So this is, and, and, and I mean, there's, there's, and there's mountain rail, front range rail, interconnectivity of light rail buses. Uh, there's a lot to that piece. I mean, the way that I look at it is the way I look at anything. Does it net save people money? So, I mean, again, you look at that cost of gas, $1,800 a year, people are paying average um and, and actually it might be 1600 now because that was calculated when gas was you know three dollars we have one of the lowest you know gas costs in the country it's great we're like 260 some a gallon now it's a little bit lower than the denver metro area 
Uh, but uh, again, it's still, you know, people are spending a lot of money on commuting. So if there's a way to save people money in there, uh, then we're all for it. I mean, if a family of four can thrive and be excited and only have one car instead of two, I mean, that can save that family thousands of dollars a year if they're able to get where they want to go. And that's money that can go into college savings, retirement, family vacations, college, uh, all of those great things that people want to spend it on, uh, not just on gas. So we, we really look at that and, and want to weigh carefully to make sure that any proposal would save people money. But in that transit space, Jesse, I, I absolutely think there is the opportunity to save people money with more and better transit. Okay, so let's just game it out, right? Let's just say there's a um, a new additional fee on a gallon of gasoline, and let's say it goes toward building, you know, better transit connectivity, so people maybe wouldn't have to buy um, as much gas. I mean, would that count in your mind as being something that would qualify as? as yeah, I mean, I just just show us the numbers, right? I mean, I don't, I don't think it'll, I don't think it'll be gas. We have uh, fees on that. There actually are some fees from gas now that go that can go to multimodal transportation. Um, but yeah, I mean, again, it's just, it's a mathematical thing. It's not a philosophical thing. I'm just going to look at, well, what does it get us, right? Is it free bus fares? Are there more buses? Is there light rail? Is there passenger rail? What does it get us where? What are the estimated savings in both time and money from people? What are the costs? And uh, do we have a scenario here where, um, you know, net, it saves Colorado's time and money. And obviously time has a dollar value attached to it too. Um, you know, whether it's time, you know, time getting to and from your job. But as I mentioned, I mean, time not being home with your kids or missing a soccer, kids college soccer game is priceless. So how can we better help people live closer to where they work and where they want to play? Also get where they want to go quicker and easier and at lower cost. And uh, just like Roads and highways take capital investment. Yes, uh, these things are generally less expensive. I mean, buses uh, uh, and transit are generally less expensive than big highway projects, but it uh, doesn't mean that they, they they don't cost anything up front. So you want to look at what that benefit is and, and how much money it saves people. So transportation um, is connected to greenhouse gas emissions. It's, I think, the biggest source of, of greenhouse gas emissions in Colorado. And one of our uh, readers wanted to know that that there was a state analysis that was released in November. My colleague Mike Booth wrote about it, and it showed that Colorado, and this was from state officials, said that Colorado would fall short of its 2030 uh, carbon dioxide reduction goals, which would also mean that the state would fall uh, short of its your 2050 goal. I think it was a campaign promise in your first election of zero emissions by that point. I wonder if we're going to see any specific legislation from your administration this session that that can accelerate or kind of catch us back up and make sure we're, we're on track. Yeah, I mean, the biggest thing we need to do, Jesse, is is what we've just talked about around transit, but it also ties into housing. So, I mean, most people don't want to have a 45 minute commute to work each way. I mean, again, if people want to and they want to have acreage and, and, and got, there's people who do that, God bless them. And they don't mind commuting, you know, an hour and a half a day, 45 minutes each way. But many people who do and I hear from many wish that they could afford to live closer to uh, where they want to be, where they work. Uh, and so. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's happened because of the housing crisis. So we could do the transit planning uh, overlay along with more and better transit, along with more affordable housing, uh, it can help us meet our climate goals. And I think that's the biggest challenge we face this session is figuring out the interplay between those so people aren't forced to live so much further from where they work and commute in a single occupancy vehicle as the only way that they can live the lifestyle they want to they live. Does that happen fast enough, though, to kind of get us back on track by 2030, 2050? Uh, well, of course. I mean, um, we we uh, and I, I don't have the document in front of me, Jesse, but I mean, glass is half full. I actually think we were something like 96 percent of the way there for 2030. So, I mean, we have made a lot of progress so far, and I I don't have that number in front of me, but I think it was only something like four or five percent more. But, yeah, I think we can get that extra uh, piece that we need from better planning about where people live, work, how they get places. We obviously already have the tax credits in place for electric vehicles. By the way, it went live January 1st. It's now uh, 7,500 tax credit for electric vehicles. Uh, encourage people as they as they look to replace their car. And uh, many electric vehicles in the 20 and 30,000 range, uh, that can be like 20% off. So it's a big deal. Lower operating costs, uh, and for people who choose to purchase them, uh, we've made uh, many models available in Colorado as well. And uh, right now, something like uh, 13, 14 percent of vehicles sold are electric in our state. All right. Well, you'll have to tell me where you can find a twenty thousand dollar electric vehicle. That that would be news to me. Um, we'll be happy to. I, I mean, there, there are some that are I, once you add up the federal and state tax credits, there's some that come in even lower than that. So we'll uh, we'll get you the information. All right. 
Um, I want to talk water. Uh, obviously, there was the commission that that was formed by the legislature, the Colorado River Drought Task Force. Uh, this didn't come out of that, but it did come out of um, one of the uh, interim committees. There's a proposal in the legislature this year that would prohibit state and local governments, as well as homeowner associations, HOAs, for planning or installing new non-functional turf, artificial turf, or invasive plant species on any commercial, institutional, or industri industrial property. I know you kind of have a libertarian streak in you, and I wonder where you come down in, in the government telling people what they can and can't plant, plant, or you know, state government telling local government or just mandating this kind of across the board. Well, we are taking a hard look at what the state does, I believe, in leading by example. So uh, we, of course, have an executive order in this area. We are reducing our state water footprint. Uh, we uh, have a lot of uh, uh, land and, and operations, and uh, we want to show the way in, in, in reducing uh, the use of, of turf and moving towards Colorado scaping. I also uh, signed a bill last session that prevents uh, HOAs from requiring uh, water intensive landscaping. Um, they, they, if, if residents of HOAs want to do zero scaping, they have to have that option. Um, so I think you see a lot of exciting things happening in Aurora, uh, also leading the way on new, uh, water efficiency codes. Um, it also factors into, frankly, this housing discussion that we're having because the type of housing that we're envisioning more of is not only more affordable and closer to work, but also far more water efficient than continuing to move further and further out, longer commutes, less water efficiency, less energy efficiency. So uh, water efficiency is very consistent with our goals around making living and uh, housing in Colorado more affordable as well. Okay. In the couple minutes that we have left here, I want to hit a few uh, big topics. Um, Tabor refunds, uh, they were flat this year under the bill passed during the special session moving forward. That's not the case. I know that you want an income tax uh, rate reduction when there is a Tabor surplus, but uh, where do you come down on this? The, the Democrats and legislature want to keep the rate flat. Is, is that what's going to happen going forward? Or are you going to continue pushing for an income tax rate cut? Yeah, I mean, we would we would you know, we need there to be an income tax cut for us to be able to negotiate anything else. That's kind of the starting point is is we want there to be an income tax rate cut. Uh, the Tabor surplus means two things. One, there's a strong economy, uh, which is terrific. Uh, but it also uh, I, I sometimes, you know, tongue in cheek refer it as a roaring policy economy. But, you know, people like to blame me when things are bad, but they don't always get credit when things are good. But um, the other thing is it means is that we're overtaxed as a state. So our our tax rates are too high. Whether it's property tax, income tax, sales tax, they all should be lower because uh, we have this huge surplus. So, I mean, you know, and again, if Democrats want to make the case to go to the voters to use some of it for schools or housing, and they've done that successfully with Prop 123 as an example, you put that on the ballot, voters consider it. Um, you know, I've uh, supported some of those in the past. That's fine. But I'm not supportive of there being uh, an enormous surplus. It simply means it's a signal that rates are too high. And the state legislature or the voters, we've had we passed two permanent uh, income tax cuts. I've supported both of them. Uh, widely popular, you know, majorities of Democrats, Republicans, independents all supported uh, the income tax rate reduction to 4.4 percent. It was 4.63 percent when I came in. We've cut it twice. And uh, and and with regard to the Tabor, it would more likely be a temporary income tax rate cut. But we're for temporary, permanent, whatever uh, can pass the legislature or go through the votes of the vote of the people. Okay. I mean, I've heard you talk about the income tax rate cut a few times, but the legislature keeps making income tax, uh, the, the Tabor refund. Well, we've cut it. We've cut it twice so by vote getting... of the people. We've cut it twice by vote of the people. Uh, I'm, you know, we can cut it through the legislature or the people. I mean, whoever it's, it, you know, it just, it needs to be cut. Uh, so obviously our, our preference is always to work with the legislature uh, and, 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 and we're not, you know, greedy in the sense of saying that, oh my gosh, the, by the way, if you cut, if you, if you'd use the entire Tabor surplus and cut income taxes, I think you'd be in the 3.9 range. We, we'd actually be below 4%. Uh, but we're, we're happy to take a more modest income tax rate cut, uh, in exchange for, you know, whatever else people want to do with other parts of the surplus, such as a one tier refund mechanism. Okay. Um, and last question here, in 2024 is going to be crowded ballot in terms of ballot measures. Uh, and I'm wondering where you're going to come down on, on two areas. One is going to be uh, a measure that will enshrine abortion access in the state constitution, lift the state ban on, on government dollars being used to pay for abortions. I, I'm assuming you're supporting that. Is that something you, you plan on campaigning for? Well, Jesse, way too early. We're talking about legislative session and I haven't seen half these bills. Um, usually what I do is a month or two before the election, I read the blue book and 
Um, you know, I'm happy to share how I'm voting if I have a strong opinion on things. Um, if things are going through the legislature, if they need my signature, I might see them a little earlier. But no, I I have not started to think about next November's ballot. Uh, we obviously will be, you know, reading a lot of bills this session and focus on that. Of course, I'm pro-choice, always have been. Uh, and, and um, you know, we'll, we'll be happy to look at uh, whatever comes down for November. Okay. And then quickly, you might have the same answer to this, but Ken Theory has put forward this, this series of ballot measures that would change the election system in Colorado uh, in terms of uh, open primaries, ranked choice voting, getting rid of um, vacancy committees, and then also making uh, all people gather signatures to get on on the ballot. Where are you at on those concepts? Um, just in the- Well, I, you know, I've... I've um... I've said positive things about some of those concepts, but again, in terms of any ballot initiatives, I will, uh, you know, look at them a couple, a month or two before the election. Uh, as far as I know, these things aren't even on the ballot, Jesse. So, I mean, I, they're very speculative at this point and, and, you know, things change in the titling board and all of that sort of thing. So I, I, uh, don't expect I will be looking at those between now and, you know, June, uh, when we, when we figure out, you know, the bills we're going to sign. All right. Well, thank you so much, Governor. I really appreciate you joining us tonight. Sorry to go over by a minute, uh, but but super appreciate your time and and thanks for answering our questions. Thanks, Jesse. Take care. All right. So we're going to head into the next section of our program here uh, with two state senators who can turn on their cameras now if they're there. Hopefully, there we go. Ah, from the Senate floor, Senator Chris Hansen, a Denver Democrat. Um, wonder why you're at the Capitol today. Um, why would you be there? We don't have to be there till next week. And then uh, <laughs> Senate Minority Leader uh, Paul Lundin, a Republican from Monument, the top Republican um, in the Colorado Senate. Thank you both for joining us tonight. Really appreciate it. Um, I guess we'll we'll jump right in here. Uh, Senator Hansen, since you're in the Senate, I guess we'll ask you the question. The first question, I want to talk about property taxes. Uh, we just talked a little bit with the governor on this. Um, we've We've had a lot of questions come in about your, your bill, a lot of reader questions come in about your bill that would tax homes use as short-term rentals for more than 90 days in a calendar year as commercial properties instead of residential. So the rate is about three times higher. I, I know that measure is going to come this session. I wonder where you're at in terms of, uh, you know, building a coalition, who you're talking to, if you feel like it, it might have a chance that this is, as you know, kind of the, uh, it's been called the grasping the nettle bill. So I wonder if, if you're if you're feeling the nettle right now and, and uh, wh- wh- where things stand. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's a fair description, Jesse. Uh, great to be with you tonight. So glad to join Minority Leader Lundin as well. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, yeah, I mean, it is a nettle. Uh, it is a tough subject to talk about, which is how should we handle the property tax treatment for uh, short term rental properties in the state. And, you know, we've we've got a first draft of that bill. I, we're expecting to do some significant amendments to that. Um, you know, I, I think the problem we're trying to solve is you've got properties that are being used uh, in some cases virtually the same as uh, lodging properties like at a hotel. In fact, we've got examples from Steamboat where they converted a hotel to short term rentals and overnight the school district lost a million and a half dollars out of their budget, which then has an immediate impact on the state budget because we then need to do more backfill uh, through the School Finance Act. So there's some really difficult uh, issues that we've got to deal with there around usage, conversion, creating an unintentional tax loophole. I think the balance that we're trying to strike, though, is to be able to allow people to own second, third properties, use them uh, in a part-time basis, totally fine, and and making sure that they're uh, taxed at an appropriate rate for that, but then treating that differently from uh, the corporate properties, the giant conglomerates that own thousands of these units across the state that are basically running them as hotels or condo hotels, that's a very different thing. And I think that's what you'll see in this debate with the short-term rental is trying to differentiate between those two and and making sure we have tax fairness in Colorado. So there's not a big difference between uh, an actual hotel, a bed and breakfast uh, and the building next door that's being used in the exact same manner. So that's, that's what we're trying to address. Can you share what, what maybe some of those amendments are? I know there's a lot of anxiety around the bill. I mean, is this going to look totally different than the than what came out of the interim committee? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think the concept is still roughly the same, which is what's the, you know, what is the right and fair way to treat different types of rental properties, short term, long term, et cetera. Um, you know, I think the amendments that we're looking at would create uh, different categories for very high use properties that are very much like hotels. 
uh, and say medium use properties that are 100, 150 days a year uh, versus properties that are rented out 30, 40 days a year. So I think there's kind of a, an idea that we're looking at around small, medium and large to, to for lack of a better descriptor uh, and, and try to really uh, line up the tax treatment for those properties with the services that they require uh, so that it's fair across all the different types of lodging. And maybe that kind of answers my last question on this for you. There are concerns among people that this will make housing markets collapse in certain part of the states, right? I mean, there were folks who bought houses, uh, you know, or condos expecting to use them as short-term rentals at a certain tax rate. And, you know, some of them say, look, the economics wouldn't work out for me at these, at these higher taxes. Um, is that maybe what you're hoping to address here? And I guess more broadly, what, what would you say to those people? Yeah, absolutely. Look, I don't, I don't think there's a, you know, the sky is not falling. I think we're just trying to do a thoughtful job of, of creating tax equity and, and tax fairness, uh, making sure we can handle the, uh, the local services that are required for different types of properties, uh, lodging and residential, et cetera. Um, so for folks that are worried about that, you know, where the intent here is not to somehow, uh, you know, destroy a certain business model or make things really tough on folks who do part-time rentals. Uh, but, you know, this is just, I think, an important discussion about tax fairness and how do we handle, you know, the, the local fire district? How do we handle uh, school funding? How do we handle uh, the extra uh, expenses of, uh, you know, infrastructure that, that go along with lodging properties? So that's really what we're trying to do. And, you know, I, I, one of the things I found interesting here is it's not a right or a left uh, kind of argument. It's not a, a, a partisan one in the normal way we might think of that, because there's a lot of uh, county commissioners from conservative counties who are struggling with this as much as you'll see, uh, you know, more more progressive counties like Summit. So uh, it's going to be a really important and interesting discussion and looking forward to tackling it in, in uh, the coming months. Well, fortunately, we have a Republican right here who we can ask about the proposal. I know um, <laughs> two years ago, Senator Bob Gardner actually brought a version of this. He was the one who called it the grass the nettle bill originally. Um, Senator Lundeen, I, I think he's actually softened his, his position on this, but I wonder where um, you, you stand on this personally and, and kind of what your views are on, on this particular change. Fair enough, Jesse. It's a pleasure to be with you. It's a pleasure to be with Senator Hansen. I was almost, uh, as it turns out, going to be in the chamber doing this myself. It would have been interesting. We could have sat side by side, Chris, or maybe we could have sat on opposite sides. Who knows? Um, but I got ahead of the snowstorm. I'm in Monument now, and the snow's coming down pretty hard down here in Monument, so I was able to get home. Um, I appreciate very much the way Senator Hansen is approaching this, and there is an array of circumstances that this, uh, in terms of the providers and how this affects various individuals. Um, the, the folks who are trying to piece together um, uh, additional income, they, they're, it's a property they've, they've acquired over the course of their life and used it, now they're renting it. Um, we need to be sure that we protect their ability to not only have one, but two or three or five or 10, if they can build a small uh, in income supplementing or quite frankly, a small business for themselves. I think that's important that we protect that. Um, and there is obviously the, the corporate tax question, I mean, the conversion of a hotel. Boy, that one is a tough one to argue. But I will give you a philosophical argument against this. Um, we just heard from the governor. The governor says we're collecting too much in taxes. I agree with that statement. We are collecting too much in taxes, property taxes, income taxes. We're sitting on massive reserves and we need to let that stay with the people. So the way I look at this is I start with the uh, the rate payer, the tax rate payer, and quite frankly, the overnight lodging rate payer. And as we raise the costs to those individuals, people, human beings, we're going to raise the cost to their family. We're going to make it harder for the people who are just trying to live their life to, in fact, live their life because we're putting an additional burden, financial burden on them as we do it. Senator Hansen makes a good point. The local jurisdictions need to figure out how to fund that fire truck, how to fund the operation of the public safety and so forth. But um, the idea of just let's go grab more money is not one that I'm ever very comfortable with. So kind of digging further into the, the property tax realm, during the special session, Republicans brought forth some um, uh, ideas for, for, for property taxes and, and longer term cuts. Some of them kind of crossed some red lines for Democrats when I think about um, tapping into reserves. Uh, and so it, you saw a very partisan split, right? The Democratic bills passed, the Republican ones met a uh, quick demise. 
heading into the regular session, right, property taxes are still going to be an issue. We've got the task force that was set up by Democrats, but there are Republicans on it. I, I, you have, a, I think, at least a few appointees on it. I wonder what Republicans are looking for and if this is going to be another kind of Democrat versus Republican thing, or if, if there are places where you might be able to find uh, middle ground. Again, this is for Senator Lundeen. Um, you know, are you thinking about ways in, in which you can bridge that divide and, and, and get some of your ideas in there? Or, or do you think it's going to be kind of a, a partisan foil type situation again? Um, I, I appreciate that. That's a great question. And I, I hope we can work towards a better policy outcome. Um, I would say in this particular conversation, there's kind of three different players. There's uh, the Democrat perspective, there's the Republican perspective, and then there's the perspective of the people of Colorado. Clearly, they batted down HH in a landslide defeat, uh, a 20-point uh, uh, defeat of that particular idea. Um, I think the things that I would like to see come out of the task force would be predictability, predictability for taxpayers. Um, and I think that over time provides some predictability also for local jurisdictions. Um, I would like to see um, things like instead of just as the one time fix that came out of the special session as allowed out or driven out by the Democrats, um, the, it only dealt with residential property taxes. I believe we need to deal with uh, non-residential commercial property taxes, because at the end of the day, um, taxes for businesses are just a cost of doing business and they're passed on to individuals. Again, individuals are crying out for relief. And we need to give the businesses from whom they get their services and uh, products to get relief as well. So we need to make sure that we're providing relief both to individuals and to commercial ventures as well. Another thing that I'm very sensitive to is we absolutely must finally make the homestead exemption portable. We honor our seniors in Colorado after 10 years in a home, they should uh, they have currently the ability to get an exemption. The exemption also goes, uh, the property tax exemption is also given to disabled veterans and now gold star families, people who've lost a, a family member in the service of the country. Making that portable, I think is beneficial not only for the individuals, but for the broader housing problem that we have. And I'm sure, Jesse, we're gonna get into housing affordability at some point. One thing we need to do is we need to give those seniors the ability to, when they decide to downsize, take that tax credit that they've got, that tax exemption they have with them to the smaller place where they might choose to downsize to. So I'd like to see those sorts of things coming out. To the political dynamic, um, this is one where I feel very comfortable. I believe that uh, the Republican arguments in this particular um, conversation have been arguments that are in alignment with the broad majority of the people of Colorado. They are asking for relief property tax relief. And quite frankly, we would like to add on to that income tax relief, but that's not part of this question. I need to unmute. I was going to say, well, I might have a question that that bridges that. Senator Hans, I know you've been interested in the past on renters uh, providing some kind of rental income tax credit. I know that some states have done this and certainly it would be a tax cut. Is that something that, that we might see this session? Um, I haven't heard too much talk oh. about that, but yeah, I mean, I, Jesse, we, we've gone beyond interest. I actually helped pass that last year. So we we did a renter's tax credit. Uh, it was relatively focused. Uh, and I think this is a year in 2024 where we could do something more broad uh, for all renters. It was focused on seniors uh, in the last uh, version of it so that we did get that in place. I'd love to extend it and expand it. Um, you know, to this point about bipartisanship, I think Paul brings up portability. The Democrats are very much in favor of portability. In fact, uh, you know, we put it on the ballot. We have supported it uh, several times, but I think we've got to find a version of it that doesn't hurt the funding for schools, that doesn't hurt the funding for other local services. So it's going to take some, some pencil sharpening, uh, but it's one of the things I'm hoping to have a great conversation about as chair of the Property Tax Commission, as we look at places where there is a lot of overlap, where there is a lot of agreement, and finding ways to implement it so that it it doesn't have a negative impact on on our kids in school, so huge areas of agreement uh, that we can can uh, come back to. And in fact, the property tax commission is majority Republicans, so it's not just there's a few Republicans on there; it's majority Republicans. Um, we are going to have a really robust discussion in a bipartisan way, and a lot of the topics we were just talking about, uh, you know, tax credits, portability. Uh, smoothing functions. We haven't talked about that yet. There's a bunch of great ideas on the table 
about how we can improve and uh, predictability and uh, assure funding for our schools and local services. So I'm, I'm feeling very optimistic about the Property Tax Commission. So property taxes, they're interconnected with school funding. Uh, it's one of, it, it, most people pay, most of people's property taxes are, uh, go to, to schools and then the rest goes to the rest of the local governments. It affects the state budget. Um, and I wanna talk about, I know this issue is school funding is near and dear to both of your hearts. So I'll start with um, Senator Lundeen. The state is expected this year to meet its minimum requirements under Amendment 23. Uh, for the first time since the Great Recession. It's eliminating the BS factor, the negative factor, whatever you want to call it. it it's been named a lot of things, but school districts say- all bad. It, It's, yeah, all bad, but school districts <laughs> say it's not enough to, just to eliminate the, the the negative factor, BS factor. So Senator Lundin, I wonder you know, if you agree with what, what they're saying and also uh, what you think the next step is that the state needs to take on education funding um, if, if the state's going to go further than just you know adhering to the Amendment 23 requirements that- you know, school funding stays on pace with inflation. Yeah, absolutely. It's um, it's important that we meet the constitutional requirement. Obviously, the people of Colorado feel strongly that the a priority and priority is first. And so the, I will call it the priority of state government. And it's uh, largely funded by local, but it's balanced by state. And at this point, it's more funded by state than by local. B, the funding of K-12 public education. Um, the reality is since the uh, Great Recession, um, we have grown government in massive ways before we met our obligation to actually pay for public education. We've created a 178 new offices, departments, programs of state government before we funded public education. My argument is we should run the School Finance Act before we run the long bill and let the long bill be connected to the fact that we have met our constitutional requirement to meet that funding, that level of funding required for K-12 public education. But here's the secret, and I'm a bit of an education policy wonk, you know, four years on the Senate Ed, five years on Senate Ed, four years House Ed, four years over at the State Board prior to that. The money isn't the solution. It's not the end all be all. We need to meet our constitutional obligation. I'm grateful that the law that Senator Zenziger and I were able to carry together, co-sponsor together, and the General Assembly pushed forward last year required that we meet that constitutional obligation. But it's about leadership at the school. And now we're diving off into an education policy conversation that walks away from the tax conversation you're wanting to have, Jesse. But the, the conversation shifts now. And, and this is kind of the dynamic. We've got people in the education um, establishment who are saying more money, more money, more money, when the reality is, I would argue more leadership, more leadership, more leadership is fundamentally critical if we actually want to get to a policy solution. And we need to get to a policy solution because we're failing 50% of the students in K-12 public education in Colorado and a larger percentage of black, brown, and children from economic challenge. We've got to fix that. I think I think I might know what Senator Hansen might say, right? But I think teachers unions and education advocates might say, you know, funding is the solution to to bridge that gap. Um, not to, I mean, maybe I'll just kick it to you, Senator Hansen, to say, you know, like, is is there more spending room for Democrats this year beyond you know the Amendment Twenty Three um, requirements and eliminating the BS factor? And and if so, what is that going to look like? Um, you know, is that going to happen? Yeah, well, Jesse, I, I, I'm glad you pointed out that table stakes this year is to eliminate the BS factor, and, and we are on track to do that. That was a commitment that we made five, six years ago. We've been able to methodically buy it down significantly every year, and this year we'll finally finish it off. Um, look, I am of the opinion that we are underfunding our schools. I, I don't agree with Senator Lundeen on, on, on this point. And for me, it's very personal because I've got two kids in Denver public schools. Uh, and from the day they started kindergarten in public schools, they have been underfunded. Uh, and this, this uh, unfortunately is continuing. Now we've got to the point where we finally paid off the BS factor. We've met sort of the minimum requirements of Amendment 23. But if you look at where we are against our competitor states, uh, we are behind. And I look, I, I'll cede to the point that we need leadership in public schools. But I also know that people need to be paid well for doing a great job. And one of the ways you get great leaders is to make sure that you have fair compensation. And I think it's pretty clear if you look at Colorado teacher pay and you compare it to other states, we are way behind. Uh, we are you know, bottom 10 in basically every category of school finance. 
So to say that money's not the answer, uh, to me, that's just too easy. Uh, it is a big part of the answer. We have to do better. If we were 25th in the country and talking about, hey, do we really need more money? That is very different from, hey, we're 49th in teacher pay or whatever the category might be. And unfortunately, that's where we're at. We're in the bottom 10 across most educational funding categories. So we need to focus on that. And uh, to say it's just leadership, I think, uh, you know, just misses uh, the, the obvious point right in front of us that we're underfunded and underfunded badly. So do I get a rebuttal? Yeah, you can. I just I just maybe to add in if you can answer this as well. Right. I mean, I wonder if the middle ground here and I know this has been talked about at the Capitol before is to set aside money specifically for teacher pay, because I've heard Republicans also complain that, that, that teachers are underpaid. So, you know, is is that where maybe there can be some agreement and, and you guys can look kind of in the cushions and say, you know, we'll, we'll send more money to schools as long as it's directed specifically toward teacher pay. And, and whatever else you want to answer, go for it. Well. Yeah, the, the Constitution is really clear about this. The 178 school districts are responsible for their budgets. They determine where it's going. The reality is we sit in the middle of the 50 states in terms of total funding per pupil. Um, and what the school local school districts choose to do with that money frequently is driven by policy mandates that come out of the General Assembly that have nothing to do with academic attainment for children. It's all sorts of other, we want to manage your business, just like my colleagues on the other side of the aisle try to do so frequently with the businesses of Colorado. We're gonna, we're gonna help you manage your labor pool better. We're gonna help you manage your calendar better. We're gonna help you manage your scheduling system better. Businesses don't need that. And the schools of Colorado don't need that. And they get a lot of that. So the funding thing is we're dead center in the middle of what's spent. But let's not look across to other states in terms of what's going on and the competition that's happening and where successes are happening. Right inside Colorado, we have parents voting with their feet. When I first got into the education policy conversation 11 years ago, 8% of the students of Colorado were in charter schools. Today, 16% of the students in Colorado are in charter schools. And those charter schools, which have a greater parent engagement, uh, they are delivering a meaningfully different, better result across all categories of measures and statistically different, better results in several meaningful categories. And so it's, and that is kind of a, a, a glimpse into this question of leadership that I'm talking about. Part of the leadership there is you have parents that are more engaged. Um, and quite frankly, I want to be really clear, those charter schools serve a larger percentage of black, brown, and children from economic challenge than do their neighborhood schools as a matter of per capita student population. So we can see right within the state where we are having successes. We need to invest in that where we're having successes. Senator Hanson, I want to move on, but do you want to 15, 30 seconds? Do you have anything? Yeah, just just really quickly. Look, I I, um, I support uh, innovation schools. I support charter schools. I support public schools. Um, I mean, that's fine. We can continue that debate about governance model and accountability and all. Those are important things. But the charter schools are underfunded. The innovation schools are underfunded. The traditional neighborhood schools are underfunded. Uh, and that is a point which I am not going to give up. Uh, well, but and I'm... I'm if we have all the money in the world, Chris, I'm in with you on that. The reality right. is scarce resources. My statement is put it in front of the other budget items that we ge generate. 173, I think it was 173 new departments, agencies, and programs of state government without funding public education fully. We've been doing it wrong for years. I want to kind of circle back around to housing and, and the couple minutes we have left here. And, and I'll start off with you, uh, Senator Hansen, kind of going back on that renter uh, focus section of things. Uh, a lot of renters have looked at the property tax debate and said, this is unfair. It doesn't affect me. Um, and obviously th there are intersections between property taxes and what people pay in rent, but Democrats have, have taken on this issue. There wasn't a ton passed last year. I wonder what, you know, voters can expect to see or Coloradans can expect to see out of the legislature in terms of uh, renter relief, whether it is, again, is there going to be some kind of income tax cut? The governor just said that he's basically against rent control and just cause eviction. Um, what what big policies can we see from Democrats on, on this uh, front? Yeah, well, I mean, look, just a few weeks ago, we did $30 million additional for the the ability to help folks in, in trouble that, that need rental assistance. So we have done some significant things on that front. I guess what I'm most interested in is trying to extend and expand our renter tax credits. 
Um, I think that's been a, a, a great method. I think it helps uh, reach the right people uh, with the right amount of assistance. Um, and so, I, you know, it's a very effective tool. I think we've proven it with uh, the senior rental assistance that we went down that track. Uh, and I think we've got a chance this, this session to look at expanding that. So, um, you know, certainly there's going to be lots of other housing debates. There's going to be other rental bills uh, that we are looking at. You know, the Democrats, I think, have been successful at, at some very uh, targeted uh, renter assistance and renter protection type of legislation. Um, you mentioned the ones the governor talked about. I'm sure there'll be versions of those that get that get refiled this year. Uh, but what I'm, uh, I think, most focused on, at least for myself and, and my work in the Senate, is can we do a better job on the on the tax credit side? And that's really effective way to to target the relief. Senator, I mean, where do you kind of come down on this? I guess both in terms of you know how how can Republicans bring solutions uh, for the high cost of rent in Colorado and other high cost of living aspects? I know this is something that you guys have. You know, you, you harp on a lot. What are some of the solutions we're going to see? Yeah, it, as a matter of just good economic policy, an earned income tax credit is a better policy than a government bureaucracy that may or may not help out the people that it's designed or supposed to be helping. So the idea of providing direct uh, relief to individuals is something I support. Now, part of the challenge we have in the special session is we raided the, the Tabor refund money to fund a, a, an earned income tax credit. I could not disagree more with the source of funding for that and could not disagree more with the policy construct as a matter of economics. So, so there's there's right ways to do things and wrong ways to do things. I think finding the correct way where we're not raiding the Taxpayer Bill of Rights refund money and and but applying state dollars and boy the state's got a ton of money we got 4.3 billion dollars among all the various reserve accounts we have plenty of money it's applying those in a, in a way that is intelligent on behalf of the people of Colorado because they're crying out for some relief okay speaking of rating taper refunds or tapping into it, whatever you want to say I mean Senator Hanson do you think the Democrats are going to try and use any of that money uh, strategically as they did maybe with property tax relief um, for something else? I mean, what, what's, is, is that, are those conversations happening? Yeah, lots of conversations. I mean, look, the earned income tax credit, which there is broad bipartisan support, uh, great to hear Senator Lundeen say that, uh, is a tax refund mechanism, as is the senior homestead exemption, is a tax refund mechanism. Um, and the Constitution is very clear that the General Assembly should set the mechanisms for tax refunds and so we'll continue to do that. Uh, you know, I, I love the EITC. I have run six bills on the expansion of the earned income tax credit. I ran several bills on the expansion of the child tax credit, which we know is massively effective at reducing childhood poverty uh, at the national and at the state level. So those are tax refund mechanisms uh, to treat Tabor uh, refund mechanism as some you know sacrosanct thing. Uh, I think ignores what Tabor actually says, which is that we should set the Tabor refund mechanisms. And so that's exactly what we'll continue to do. And I think EITC and child tax credit are two amazing examples of how we have very carefully done that. Senator Lundin, go ahead if you want to for 15 or Sure, seconds. sure. I, I think that the voters of Colorado have been really explicit. The one place that they have said you may use as a constitutional matter, you may use Tabor refunds is in the homestead exemption for seniors um, and now for uh, disabled veterans and Gold Star families. Um, beyond that, it's it's certainly flying in the face of it. It is flying against the intent, the design of a refund. We're, we, what we've got now is a an effort of by the by my Democrat colleagues. Bless them. I love them all to reallocate and redistribute money instead of refunding it to the people who paid it in. And we did talk to the governor a little bit about that. So we've got about one minute left. And Senator Lundeen, since you're not at the Capitol, I can ask you an election question. Um, <laughs> okay. election here, so I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask uh, an election question. Um, so it's an election year. And while your caucus won't be able to win back a majority uh, for the 2025 session, um, that's just a mathematical reality. You do hold a few seats. Uh, you do need to hold on to a few seats and maybe pick up a few to be competitive in 2026. If that doesn't happen, then you guys are going to have problems for even longer. I wonder how your strategy at the Capitol this year is going to reflect that and, and what your the messages you're going to try and you know send to voters kind of in the, the couple months that you have to, to get their attention. 
Yeah, absolutely. It it's, feels like it's been a while since Republicans had a tailwind. And we found and felt a tailwind with this the 23 election. The way the taxpayers um, and voters of Colorado said, we believe in principles that are uh, held forth and argued on behalf of constantly by the Republican Party as they knocked HH down, gave us a sense of we as a party are connected to the people of Colorado on the kitchen table issues, on the tax relief issues, on the regulatory relief issues that uh, they, they in fact care about and interact about. So we we have a, a sweet spot to go to politically and, and that's where we'll be going is, is connecting with the people of Colorado on the kitchen table issues that I, I think my Democrat colleagues maybe are, are missing the boat on. Senator Hansen can't respond because of his uh, choice to, I don't know if you're allowed to technically, but as to being at the Capitol. It's semi-policy. I wouldn't hold it against him. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I'll just say one quick thing, which is the dynamic that we've seen uh, on the last several cycles. Uh, there's going to be a lot of repeat because of the nominees uh, for president. And uh, I think Senator Lundeen knows that. Um, and I also think the voters of Colorado care deeply about uh, the abortion issue and making sure that we protect choice in the Constitution. Uh, and I'm very much looking forward to seeing that pass in 2024. All right. Well, we'll have to leave it there. I, I appreciate you both for joining, both for joining us tonight. Thank you for, for taking some time out of, I know it's a busy, hectic week right before the session. And uh, I look forward to seeing you in that red room uh, just a, a, a few days. We'll be locked in there for quite a while. Thanks, Thanks so Jesse. Thanks, Senator yeah. Hansen. All right. So for the last 30 minutes of our program, I'm going to hand things off to my colleague, uh, Brian Eason, a fellow political reporter at The Sun. He likes to be called a policy reporter because he is a, the policy nerd uh, on our team. He'll be speaking with the uh, House Speaker Julie McCluskey, a Dillon Democrat, and House Minority Leader Mike Lynch, a Wellington Republican, uh, the top Republican in the House. I'll note that Lynch this week announced his bid to represent Colorado's fourth congressional district, but he's staying on in his role as minority leader. So, uh, Brian, the, the floor is yours. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Jesse, and uh, thank uh, you both so much for joining us um, and for your patience. I know it's uh, getting a little late in the evening. Um, Madam Speaker, I, I'd like to start with with you if you are if you're on here. Um, so uh, Colorado's cost of living is one of the, I think you would agree, one of the biggest issues facing the state right now. Uh, we at The Sun have had an ongoing series looking at how high prices for everything from housing to concert tickets have, have skyrocketed in recent years. What specific plans do you have to make Colorado a more affordable place to live? Uh, well, first of all, hello, Brian, and excited to be here tonight with my partner, Minority Leader Lynch. Great to see you, Mike. Um, and really appreciate this opportunity to talk a little bit about what is coming in the second session of the 74th General Assembly. Um, you're absolutely right. The cost of living, the affordability crisis um, is, I think, still the top issue that our communities are facing. I represent six counties up in the high country, and whether we're talking housing, health care, child care, food, um, being able to, uh, you know, achieve a job that pays a living wage and cover those expenses is becoming less and less attainable. So this session, I think we will continue our march to press for uh, more pathways to create affordable housing. I'm excited to say that a lot of the dollars we invested in affordable housing policy and projects um, over the past few years, uh, whether that was ARPA funding or one-time state dollars, you know, we're starting to see those dollars roll out, sticks in the ground. Um, I know in my communities, we're starting to see housing projects come online, and that increase in inventory is really critical. I think this year um, there is uh, a good momentum to bring back some of the ideas that we saw in Senate Bill 213 last spring, whether that's a focus on transit oriented communities, creating more density around transit hubs, um, focusing maybe on ADUs, uh, accessory dwelling units. How can we help uh, create more inventory through more ADUs? And I think we'll continue to stay very focused on helping our renters 
um, be able to secure and stay in housing. You know, we talk a lot um, about property taxes and the impacts of purchasing, the challenges of purchasing a home. Um, thrilled with our special session and the seven bills that we delivered for Coloradans, property tax relief, rental assistance, um, more than a million Coloradans will get more back in their Tabor refunds, uh, additional dollars uh, for low income, hardworking Coloradans through the EITC, uh, earned income tax credit bill, uh, so really, uh, you know, pleased with the work that we did in that special session, and I think we'll build on that momentum with housing. Uh, certainly, we'll see more around healthcare this year, and how can we make healthcare more affordable and accessible. And I'm looking forward. You know, we don't have bills yet in front of us, but I'm looking forward to having some really good discussions with my colleagues about uh, problem solving and what more can we do to make that Colorado dream achievable for everyone. Minority Leader Lynch, uh, thank you for joining us as well. And I've got the same basic question for you. Do you have any specific proposals this session that you think would, would help make Colorado more affordable? Yeah, thank you, Brian. This is a, um, fun fun getting ready to be ramped up for, uh, for, for what is inevitable, which is the, the session. But yeah, you know, <clears throat> always the, the, the mantra I have is let's get the government out of the way uh, you know, I, I think, you know, anything we can do to reduce the burden that we that that we have put on uh, the the efforts for builders to build, rather that uh, you know one of the big ones is is uh, uh, construction defects. If we can get something uh, done this session, I think there's an appetite for that uh, to to reduce that liability that is scaring, quite frankly, developers out of the state. I think that's you know that's a that's a good starting point to get um, to to, to, to kind of let that free market fly, um, and I, I think that's one of the the best ones. Uh, you know, and then obviously um, we uh, the the speaker and I might disagree a little bit on this, but uh, there is definitely more work to be done with the uh, with the property tax issue. I mean, I, I've got a lot of fixed income folks that are really, really scared. Um, they're related to me, by the way, <laughs> that are like, how are we, you know, how are we going to afford to, to live in Colorado uh, when uh, these property tax rates are going through the roof? And, and so that's an interesting balance that, you know, what, where is the state's real role there when it comes to, you know, uh, managing what really happens at the local level? And, uh, you know, what can we do at, at the state level to, um, to get out of the way of making sure that those those uh, municipalities and those those county officials feel the feel from their constituents that hey we've got to do something where it really impacts folks and that's at the county level um, and once again so uh, you know my my solution is for you know the state to get out of the way let's encourage that activity um, and and hopefully that will. Uh, that will encourage them to reduce those rates that, that are affecting folks on the property tax issue. But, you know, that is, that is, that is not done J just because we've got a one year, no matter, no matter how great we may say the, the solutions that came out of that special session are. Um, and, and like I said, I would disagree with them being great, but, but they're only for one year, no matter what. I mean, even if they were the best solutions in the world, those are just for one year. And so now I think um, uh, it, now's the time that we've got to tackle that. We look forward to bringing the expertise of the folks in my caucus uh, that really represent rural Colorado. You know, I tell a lot of, a lot of people, the R behind my name is not really Republican, it's really rural because it just, that's the way the chips have landed here in the state that the Republican districts are the rural districts. And so uh, we're really um, insistent that those voices get heard and that we don't create a solution that may work great for the Denver Boulder corridor, but doesn't work for the rural parts of the state. So. Uh, Ryan, can I jump on that? Please, absolutely. <laughs> you know, I, I actually want to, uh, I'm going to agree with you, Mike. I, uh, sorry, Minority Leader Lynch. Um, <laughs> I do think property tax is a significant uh, threat to our future viability as a state. And I'm, I'm pleased that we have stood up a property tax commission, um, great representation from our counties. And I'm, I'm looking forward to their work. It's a compressed timeline. 
Um, our voters told us that Proposition HH wasn't the long-term solution. And I know this commission is full of uh, incredibly smart and talented people who are committed to finding that long-term solution. And I'm, I'm hopeful that we will see a recommendation come forward that we can all support later this spring. And I would emphasize that I have six counties on the Western Slope, larger than five of our United States, and uh, no matter what the letter is after my name, I've got a lot of rural in there too. So I, I share that with you, uh, Minority Leader Lynch. Um, I like the rural parts of our state as well. Uh, let's stay on property taxes for a second. Uh, Representative Lynch, your caucus, I think, opposed just about every piece of legislation that, that passed during the special session, right? And that right. includes some property tax cuts that I think many Republicans said didn't go far enough. Um, do you see a realistic path to getting bipartisan support for, for your proposals? Because what I keep seeing is Republicans propose tax cuts and Democrats are like, yeah, but this affects schools, this affects local governments. Um, uh, how do you, what do you see as the path forward that can actually get some, get some agreement here? Right. Well, uh, just to make a commentary about one of the things that was interesting that I learned at the special session, and, and I saw this in the discussions there, is that um, you know there was an there was an effort I think to defend or protect the state's money, and the, and this comes in with you know why would we tap into our reserves uh, at the cost of citizens having to tap into their their pockets, and that. Um, so there's kind of, to, to start off, there's kind of an ideological barrier that we've got to get through there. Um, and, and we were, you know, pounding the table saying, this is, this is, you know, taxpayers money. This is our constituents money. Um, you know, we're always optimistic that we will be included in those conversations. Um, I, I, I would like to be optimistic that, that we will really, really listen to what this commission comes up with. I, th I think its composition has the opportunity to bring some very good feedback. Um, but I've, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna be naive to commissions and task force that I've seen that, um, that are, they end up producing the result that, that somebody else wants to make. In this case, you know, let's hope the governor does not uh, have a predetermined uh, a predetermined idea of what he wants this commission to come up with. Um, so I'm always optimistic of that. I have to be optimistic as the super minority leader. Uh, that's what keeps me coming back is that we're, um, that those voices will be heard. Um, so, you know, we're always, we're always willing to be there, you know, in, in this last discussion, um, you know, we really do feel like we, we, weren't heard in that discussion. We and, and that's not that's not necessarily the speaker's fault. That a lot of that came from the governor's office and, and the departments that um, that we had a hard time getting a, a seat at the table with. And so we're optimistic that that'll happen. Uh, I, I believe that the good minds at the Capitol can come up with a solution. Um, and so we'll, we'll see what that is, and we'll see if we really do listen to that commission when we when it comes time to craft that legislation. Uh Madam Speaker, let's let's stay on taxes, but but talk a little bit about the senior homestead exemption because I think that uh, portability has gotten a lot of yes. the attention. Um, but another issue that you know I've heard from folks is it's just worth way less than it was when voters added to the Constitution in two thousand, right? Like homes used to be used to cost two hundred thousand, and they'd get hundred thousand dollars off their assessment. Now a house is worth six hundred thousand or seven hundred thousand. They're getting the same level level of tax break. Uh, would would you support updating it so that it provides more relief? And and if so, should that money come out of the current Tabor refund mechanism or or something else? Yeah, great question, Brian. We have a couple members in the House who have worked, I think, for years in thinking about the proper senior homestead property tax exemption through a, a means test. Right, uh, you're right the dollars don't go as far as they used to. And at the point the pandemic hit, um, you know, that there was a lot of discussion about cutting the senior homestead tax exemption. We would have had to zero it out since it is in the constitution. Um, but we didn't recognizing how critical it was to be able to provide that particularly for seniors on a fixed income um, and seniors 
who are at a different economic point in their lives when you know paying tax bills becomes that much more difficult. I would certainly support um, an approach like that that would recognize um, we have, you know, like all parts of our society, we have seniors on a continuum, some on a, a fixed income and probably a very modest home or, or modest townhome, apartment, apartment condo. Um, and then we've got folks up in, in my part of the world who live in million dollar homes or are in their retirement and uh, may not be on a fixed income in a much more uh, solid financial state. Then I think the relief could be applied for that senior in the lower uh, income bracket and have a much more meaningful and important impact. So um, while I know members have talked about it uh, for as long as I've been here in the house, I don't know that anything is coming forward, but it, it's an excellent point to raise. And I will just say in general, uh, this last uh, interim this summer, I hosted a town hall with a focus on the challenges many of our seniors are facing uh, on the Western Slope. And you know, not only for those that are fortunate to own the rising property tax increases, but the cost of living really hits our senior community hard when they're on a fixed income and we're seeing the kind of skyrocketing prices uh, in our communities. So it's, um, you know, it's, a, it's a group of people in our state that we really wanna work to protect and love to see what may come next. I'm going to pivot off property taxes for, for a little bit here. Uh, Madam Speaker, two representatives in your caucus have uh, resigned in the last month, and both of them kind of pointed to what they said it was kind of a vitriolic atmosphere at, at the Capitol. Um, how are you responding to those complaints? Are you Have you taken any concrete actions to kind of promote a more positive environment at the legislature? What, what do you think is going on there? Uh, thank you for the question, Brian. Um, let me start first by saying, you know, we have seen an erosion of civility. We've seen disrespectful debate and name calling at the national level for several years. And certainly the uh, environment on social media, um, the, the posts that I see, uh, particularly from politicians, is very disturbing. And I think we're starting to see shadows of that national landscape here in our state. Um, I am strongly committed to promoting a civil, constructive, collaborative working environment in the chamber. We have house rules and decorum in place. We have uh, counseled members when they have failed to follow those house rules and decorum guidelines. And we are underway with work to help our members better understand some of the expectations um, uh, how words can impact people, uh, create a culture that may uh, be considered or feel hostile in ways. And I'm, uh, I'm excited because I think helping to provide more clarity for members on what is acceptable and what isn't, um, certainly um, lifting up our workplace harassment policy, our workplace expectations policy, policies that help guide uh, respectful and appropriate behaviors in and outside of the chamber. Um, I was very sorry to lose Reps, Reps Dixon and Sharbini. Uh, they were first term uh, members and uh, have a very promising career ahead of them. Um, and I, I am committed to making sure that as we move forward, uh, we move forward uh, in collaboration with our Republican caucus members uh, in working to make sure that everyone feels safe, comfortable, um, and that the culture here uh, does not stray into the same abyss that we see at the national level. Uh, Minority Leader, do you have do you have any any thoughts on this subject? Uh, some of your members, I think, have uh, at times said some of offensive things as well. Uh, have you asked, have you talked to your members about toning it down or, or being more respectful uh, in their comments in the well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, just overall, the, the, you know, the, the speaker touched on it, I think, great with the, the overall evolution of social media and the constant the constant uh, eye on what you're doing or the constant ability to express your frustration. Um, 
one of these days I'm going to figure out how to work Twitter. Um, I, I probably best that I don't know how to work it. I really don't recommend it. Okay. Well, now it, it's already changed name. I guess it's something else now, but, but, you know, no, I think, you know, that gives an opportunity and it's really, it's a generational thing too. We're seeing, there's a lot of young members um, in, on the floor of the house of representatives that, that, that has been their way of communicating. Um, and, and without, without filter, right. And without, you know, uh, uh, rules around dialogue, which is much different when you're talking face to face with somebody, uh, you'll have a, a much different tone than you would have if you feel you have the security of the uh, internet to, 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 to make your comments not as uh, viable, but they actually are. And so, um, you know, it's a weird time that we're living in right now, and it's a weird transition. And, you know, I, I think we're getting caught up with that at the, at the state level. Um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, and, and I agree, you know, there's some bad examples out there that, um, that don't, don't give us, um, you know, good, good role models <laughs> at the national level, to, to be quite honest. And, um, but no, I mean, we're, we're, we're by no means blameless on this, um, but you also have the issue of, well, it, when do you, when are you clamped down too much on speech and when are you infringing upon somebody's, you know, it, it may not be what you want to hear about a bill or about some policy, um, you know, so, you know, I'm, I'm very cautious to make sure that we don't, uh, in, in the process, or, you know, this is a true throw the baby out with the bathwater situation, in the process of trying to make sure that we have respectful language, that we don't miss some of the, some of the messages that are in between some of the, uh, you know, some of the things that might be offensive to somebody, so. Uh, tough, uh, tough, tough environment right now. I'm gonna pull a few few questions that our readers have have submitted. Uh, one of them deals with with the migrant crisis that we're seeing in in Colorado. Uh, I wanted to see if if either of y'all have uh, any legislative plans for dealing with this crisis, and, and what you guys think is is maybe the most needed right now to assist with. Uh, all of the folks that that are are coming into Denver and and needing housing and and services and so forth. Um, Madam Speaker, I'll, I'll start with you. Thank you, Brian. I uh, I want to say that the concerns that my caucus has certainly had for the migrants who have arrived uh, focus primarily on making sure they have safe housing and food. Um, that we are uh, providing that immediate. Um, support as as people arrive. You may be aware, Brian, that our joint budget committee just passed a, an emergency supplemental five million dollars uh, to help provide uh, to 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 funnel funding through nonprofits to be able to provide those services. Uh, Representative Elizabeth Velasco, who lives up in the mountains next to my district, um, there were a uh, hundred migrants living under a bridge in Carbondale. Um, and that, you know, Carbondale, a very small rural mountain community, the weather, uh, you know, now some of our coldest temperatures of the year and uh, the fear and concern in taking care of people to make sure they were safe and healthy was a priority. I lift up her efforts to work with the JBC um, along with um, our focus to continue to support Denver um, in their efforts to help migrants as they arrive and uh, um, make that transition a smooth and safe one. Uh, I know earlier, do you have anything to, to add on this on this subject? Do you, do, well, you see I mean, a, do you see a role for the state in, in helping uh, with the migrant crisis? Well, you know, th th this is really a federal issue in, in that we've got our borders wide open right now. But um, and, and really, it's a Denver issue, too. Uh, it, you know, Denver, last time I checked, is still a, a sanctuary city. Um, I think it's unfair to those migrants to, to have uh, an expectation that you're going to be taken care of here. Uh, and, and, and to a certain extent, we could do that. But now we're seeing so many of them. Um, you know, I see this inevitably being elevated to a state level. I mean, these are humans. These are people that are here. Rather, uh, you know, how they got there, uh, you know, is a is one conversation. But once they're there, we have to figure out what we're going to do. So I, you know, I see there 
they're becoming a state role in this. And it's not just Denver. I, I mean, uh, in my district, they're, it, it, you know, they're, they're, they're getting, they're spreading throughout the state. Um, and then it becomes, you know, th those municipalities issues. Um, so, you know, we, we can't, we can't be without compassion. I, I think that we can do more to, uh, to, to, have the expectation of these people that you, you, you're not going to necessarily get taken care of. If we keep on giving that expectation that you're going to be taken care of, they're going to keep coming. Um, and unfortunately with, you know, as a small business owner that would love to hire somebody, but I can't because the, the minimum wage is so high, um, Colorado may not be the right place for them to be. Um, but, but once again, once they're here, we'll have to figure out how to make sure that we're not letting people die on our streets. So uh, I see it being elevated to a state level uh, uh, sooner than later, actually. Well, immigration is actually a great transition. You know, you're, of course, running for, for Congress now. Uh, how will you balance your responsibilities at the Capitol with, with this run? I mean, can yeah. you fundraise for your campaign and your caucus at the same time? How will you manage campaigning while working at the legislature? Talk a little bit about how that's how that's going to work. Yeah, well, you know, I uh, seven days after graduation, I was in the military, and I've been running hard ever since. Uh, yeah, the schedule at West Point that I had was pretty darn rigorous, and so I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to go lean back on some of my old old days when I was just constantly moving. Um, you know, every single member of the House of Representatives is up for re-election right now, so um, it's not all that odd for you know somebody to have to do election stuff while while serving. Uh, if I w if I was not seeking this office, I would be still be running for re-election. So um, I uh, I will figure out how to do it. I know how to work really hard, and uh, that's what this is going to take. It's going to be a challenge. There's no doubt. Uh, we'll but we'll uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, we have a few minutes left here. I want to get to a to a few other other questions. Water issues in the state, I think, have, have been a big issue, focus for both of you. Uh, are y'all satisfied with the the task force or the uh, the drought task force uh, work over the, over the interim? Uh, and are there any pr proposals that you particularly like or really want to see past this session? Uh, Madam Speaker, I'll start with you. Thank you for the question, Brian. Uh, you know, I am really pleased with the work of the Colorado River. Colorado River Drought Task Force, that's a mouthful. Um, you know, they were given a charge uh, to look at what role the state could play in helping to address the significant drought that our state is facing. And when we talk about the Colorado River, um, its vitality uh, is so critical to our water future, but to the water future of the entire West. Uh, there's a responsibility in how we uh, look at our own internal policies within this state, whether you're Western Slope or Eastern Slope, um, which is how the great water world divides itself. Um, priorities, uh, you know, priorities can be very different. In my communities, uh, outdoor recreation is based on our water supply, right? Whether we're talking snow in the winter or our healthy rivers in the summer. And uh, I've, I've said in multiple occasions that the Colorado River is much more than a waterway. It is the tradition and spirit of what it means to be a Coloradan. I'd even say it's a romantic adventure for us when we talk about water in the on the Western Slope, um, it is our lifeblood. And the task force came forward with a, a group of recommendations that I think are, are, are very exciting. Uh, in -stream, protecting in-stream flows uh, will be one that I hope we can move forward this year along with uh, some of the interesting perspectives on water projects and infrastructure. Uh, there were two ideas that I think given a little more time would have also borne fruit. One was about uh, shepherding water, uh, a very uh, light approach to how we might protect water in a, a thoughtful uh, approach in conservation, and then also industrial wastewater, how we might be able to uh, uh, be sure that we secure coal water in the future and protect that. Um, I, I was a part of an event uh, just a couple of weeks ago with the Shoshone uh, hydropower plant uh, near Glenwood Springs, and excited to say that the state is now in a position uh, 
uh, to help support uh, financial interest in securing the senior water right that is currently owned by Excel for the Shoshone power plant. Um, if we're able to secure that, it could be a significant boost um, for uh, you know, protecting the water in the Colorado River for decades, if not generations to come. So really excited uh, with that project. It will require an investment from the state that could come through our water projects bill, which we carry every single year. And uh, yeah, I, I'd love to talk about this one again, Brian, because it is, it is certainly important to me, my district, and ultimately for our entire state. Definitely. Well, we're, we're right at time, but minority leader, I do want to give you a chance if there's any particular water proposal yeah. you, you want to, you want to mention here. Uh, real brief. I mean, it, it, and the speaker's right. It, you know, the West is really, uh, really defined by water. It, whatever we can do uh, at the state level without encroaching upon or, or, you know, jumping on private property rights of, of, of our farmers and ranchers, uh, we should do. You know, we, we were actually, fortunately or unfortunately, set back with a very wet year last year uh, that had the other states really at the bargaining table. And, uh, and, and now, you know, the, now there's not quite the push. And so uh, we can't let the fact that we've got, uh, we are at a place right now that we weren't at last year to keep us from continuing to work hard on these water issues in the state. I've got municipalities in my district that are done building because we're out of water. Um, so it's, it, 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 it is the lifeblood of, of our growth in this state. So. All right. Well, I, I think that's all the time we have. I, I do want to thank you all again for joining us and, and thank you both so much for your time. Uh, I'm going to kick it back to uh, Jesse for a quick uh, for a quick wrap up here. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate all of your time tonight. Thank you to our previous panelists and the governor. Uh, just a reminder to, to become a Colorado Sun member to make events like this possible. And if you become a premium member, you get the unaffiliated newsletter where we write about all these people all the time. Uh, and <laughs> back the curtain on Colorado politics and policy. Again, it's an election year. The unaffiliated is, is what you need to kind of navigate all the ins and outs of, of Colorado politics and what's going to be happening over the next 12 months. I want to thank again our sponsors of tonight's event, the Colorado Education Association and Aponte and Busam Public Affairs for, for supporting our work and, and making this possible as well. And finally, just once again, the Colorado Sun is a member of the Trust Project. Uh, and you can see our commitment to trusted journalism at coloradosun.com slash ethics. So we'll all be back at the Capitol on Wednesday. The governor's state of the state address is on Thursday. So stay tuned to the Colorado Sun for the, the next year as, as we uh, follow all these folks uh, and what they're doing. Um, thanks again for joining us and have a great safe night.